Blizzard is currently a solution seeker for Innovation House Australia, with experience across a wide range of areas including sales, service, technical and management. He has a passion for high performance building practices with expertise in a vast range of building products and materials. While representing manufacturers and suppliers across the North Queensland region, Rowan started seeking out like-minded professionals to set about demonstrating and making changes for better housing outcomes. So yes, uh, I come from a practical hands-on um, background of construction and understand that uh, that's not enough to make or to implement change. So we've embarked on a thinking and a conversation around um, challenging our systems and process. And that's the human part of this whole equation that uh, is by far the bigger, uh, the bigger challenge. So Innovation House is our thinking process in our business, that is a consulting business and formerly a construction business. And my name's Rowan. Talking about the sustainable development goal, um, we're, you know, the headline talks to ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns. And if we break that apart, you know, what is a sustainable development goal? Sustainable is thinking about maybe making do with what you have while leaving behind sufficient for future generations. And I think we're all fairly agreed the science is in, the evidence is, empirical evidence is everywhere we look, that we're not doing that currently. Um, historically, we have done that. Our Indigenous um, occupiers of uh, the land have lived tens of thousands of years in harmony. Um, and when we look at some examples through this presentation and conversation this evening, it's not that far or difficult to achieve sustainable practice again. Thinking about development, maybe we should consider both uh, new as well as the existing product. Uh, it becomes attractive to think about shiny new things for retail sale, presented with a glossy magazine and a high pressure selling ad. Um, but our existing infrastructure, thinking about the Australian context, is 10 million existing homes. Now, in the best construction year, we'll do maybe 200,000 homes. So the greatest impact we can have are perhaps in the existing homes around us, which maybe isn't as sexy as buying a shiny new one, but by far the biggest impact we can have. And then what is a goal? Just a dream with a date. Um, so the Sustainable Development Goals is the website's enormously powerful. Um, I started looking for data and research and numbers, which becomes um, perhaps overwhelming, perhaps not overwhelming. So do your own research and, and be informed if you find that uh, you're looking for the numbers. Um, this slide presentation has links to any of my reference uh, sites. And ultimately, I would encourage all of us to speak our own truth rather than necessarily uh, take on board my words or my particular message, maybe I can inspire you to find out more about what a sustainable house might look like for you, what would sustainable behaviours look like for you and your family, um, and what can we do uh, both at a small individual scale and then with forming partnerships with organisations like Thrive in a larger, larger scale uh, influence the world around us. Um, it has to be a sustainable journey that we walk our talk ourselves. So it's interestingly that some of these stats are, are mind-blowing, but I, the one that stands out for me that even today we are still expending more money on fossil fuel subsidies um, contributing to the climate crisis. Um, these numbers are 2015 and 2018, and I'm sure we haven't stopped that behaviour by 2022. Um, and if you're like me buying fuel at the petrol pump recently, it's been quite a disastrous conversation around why am I paying $1.80. So I'd like for each of us to take away some messages out of tonight's conversation. Um, and I don't propose that they'll be easy answers. So this is us 
can you see the mouse on the screen down the, in that photo there? We're just putting on our gym boots and we've got our water bottle there for hydration and we're about to do a workout. Um, hopefully you'll get inspired by some of that. This is not intended to be a conversation around the easy answers. Um, it's specifically, tonight I'm specifically speaking from an Australian experience. Um, I have no international experience, but I have, I understand that uh, in the world stage, Australia likes to talk itself up, um, but our housing is far from the most advanced, is far from the most high, highest performance, is far from the most valuable or affordable housing. Um, some of our laconic Australian uh, self-image isn't borne out by the evidence in our housing. Um, so I have in, uh, had direct input to building project homes, uh, high-performance homes uh, and aged care homes as, as some examples and almost everything in between. Um, you will see me today with some scars and some grey hairs and uh, a lot of that has been born from trying it the hard way. Um, I generally don't do easy. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, messages and consumer information is all about the easy. Um, but saving humanity, we need to be challenged and change and challenging is difficult. So hopefully you get something out of this. Um, that inspires you to look at your own personal individual behaviour, maybe your household behaviour, and then maybe in organisations like Thrive and Community that we can work on our larger behaviours uh, for sustainable homes for everybody. Perhaps fundamentally, um, Australia has it too easy. Um, if we think about a world stage, uh, we don't have volcanoes erupting and burning down our Spanish villages or Tongan uh, islands. Um, we don't have uh, the Midwest of um, the estates where they have um, um, hurricane corridors that um, knock their towns down. Um, and we don't have extreme cold. You know, we don't have sub-30 Siberian or Alaskan experiences um, we have very benign conditions. It's quite easy to house ourselves and shelter ourselves. Some of the examples here are uh, very clearly low impact on environment. Um, a, a, some timbers with a bit of stringy bark slung over it for our original um, occupants. Um, you quite clearly, they wouldn't have transported that a lot of carbon miles. They would have sourced the timber and the bark from the local, uh, like from local location, and it wouldn't have been um, much impact on the environment at all. Today, in the middle picture, when we go camping, we can uh, sling a family, family of five, into a car and take a shelter and supplies in a fairly small footprint. Um, not a huge impact, and when we in fact pack that campsite up there's probably not a lot of impact left behind after we're gone. So sustainable is leaving behind uh, something for the future and not have, you know, living within our means. And on the right here, this is a modern 2019 um, shelter for grandparents and kids that uh, have taken uh, use of the current uh, stringy bark equivalent and made themselves a, a decent shelter um, and that is a fairly sustainable outcome. You can see that it's repurposed, recycled from what was originally uh, maybe a roof somewhere. So these are all um, fairly sustainable outcomes. The obvious thing is we tend to live at a level with far more than that. So we make a conscious choice um, and perhaps, you know, you can't have a, thrive interconnected webinar in a campsite um well in fact maybe you can but we still don't right our, our general behavior is not to do that 
might be nice for a camp or a, or a weekend, but maybe it's not our permanent way of living, looking at housing today. Difficult is the path. Now, <laughs> this might be representative of a lot of households where you wonder how anything goes on in that space. Um, some of the questions, you know, why do first home buyers need four bedrooms? It doesn't seem like a overly complex question until you realize that we don't offer anything other than four bedroom houses. So if you don't offer anything, um, generally, I mean, this is a massive oversimplification, but banks don't want to lend to less than four bedrooms. Builders don't want to build less than four bedrooms. Industry wants parcels of land that can be cut up and put four bedrooms on it. So generally, we aren't offering uh, something else. Is the enormous level of first home buyer debt a great way to start families? Now, again, maybe these are perfectly fine answers for some people, but we have got a very monoculture response. Everything is the same. So offering every first home buyer a four bedroom one and it's a half a million dollars and let's get into it. Um, the debt level by way of example, in, 19, in the 70s in Australia, we would, a bank would look at 30% of one household income to assess uh, mortgage uh, capacity. Now they will look at up to 40% of two household incomes to look at mortgage um, capacity. Money has never been cheaper than it is today. Um, and we are setting ourselves up for some significant um, challenges if, this, if the current status quo changes. Individually, do we make our own bed and practice mindful, healthy habits? I'm guilty. I haven't, I don't do that for sure. Um, but we can only try, right? So we can't, we can't ridicule or criticise someone else if we aren't practising good habits ourselves. Uh, but maybe we can build each other up. Maybe we can encourage others. And maybe we can not be so hard on ourselves if we didn't today. Maybe we can try and do that again tomorrow. Um, and in this individual desire, the answer, because somebody says they want another bedroom or want another bathroom or they want something? Or do we need to consider what is the impact and what is the cost of that, both monetary, but perhaps the bigger question is as a planet? Or do we need a second planet? I didn't say that'd be easy. Um, and there is obviously some of us thinking about, you know, plan B planet. I'm not sure that's my option, but that's valid for some. So typically in construction, um, so I've spent uh, 25 years in and around the construction space. And so the general response, they look for quick, simple answers. So if the housing's not quite right, what's the quick, what's the first thing I do, I go to? Uh, so we add a battery. We flatten our peak demand curve and putting a battery in will be perfect to do that. You can fill it up off peak um, when power's uh, in excess in the grid, and then you can flatten your demand curve from four o'clock till 8 p.m. when everyone's home turning all the appliances on. So maybe that's the answer. Um, or maybe it's a thermal performance and we need a white roof. Okay, we'll go around and stick white, white roofs on everything. Or you know, solar systems. We need panels. Everyone needs solar panels. 
um, then we, you know, maybe it's more stars. Maybe if anyone, everyone had seven stars as opposed to six star homes, that would be better. Uh, and or maybe more regulation. You know, the building code is about to have a renewal that uh, you know, happens typically every three years. And each three years, there's a, you know, a higher level of performance demanded in the building code. But I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen, but that floating mass of plastic in the ocean doesn't have an easy answer. Individually, we could maybe not put plastic in the water, but there's all this waste already there. It's a complex answer. It's in international waters. You know, it isn't straightforward, much like housing. This is a picture of the Amazon forest, which has been burning for 20 years. Um, we haven't fixed it yet, um, but clearly we could. And this is a gentleman who's obviously got into a particular shape over a period of time that doesn't have an easy answer. In a common sense way, we could answer each of these questions. But we need to, in a common sense way, individually answer the questions on a daily basis as an ingrained habit, rather than thinking it's too big or not doing our own individual practice. So thinking about batteries and thinking about uh, household scale for a moment, um, I'm just being a bit conscious of time. Um, the technology has rapidly advanced. So initially when batteries and being off grid was first spoken about at a household level, it was a major capital investment. So we're talking north of $50,000 for a solar panel, um, some lead acid batteries, some sort of technology to talk between those two. This might have been 20 years ago. Um, and it was the domain of the um, those change agents who had financial wherewithal to do it. And mostly people were doing it at that stage because they were rebelling against getting a, a utility power bill. I'll show them, I'll spend $50,000 on my house so that I don't get a $800 quarterly power bill. Um, now, that's an ego, that's a, that's a driven by, and we need early adopters to go and cut this ground and go and install battery systems. So I'm not dismissing that, but that now clearly isn't the answer at a household level. The answer for a household is probably you need to network about 40 together. And when you network 40 together, it's about the right scale to get efficient battery storage. Um, the, the energy management system seem to be uh, cost benefit ratio at about that scale makes sense. Um, and this actually happens pretty regularly, 40 household lots on a single feeder line in a new development. So we have the ability to say to developers, when you're doing a new sub stage of development and there's 40 houses in it, if they're on the one feeder line, can you not put in the huge infrastructure upfront cost that you typically do? Can you network the power supply amongst that group so that they're 50%, 80%, 100% powered by renewable energy? So that's readily available. There are caveats, questions, and challenges. So it is not an easy answer. So we did a house where we were talking about doing a battery off-grid suburban display home. And we ultimately connected to the infrastructure because it was running along the footpath out the front. And it's madness if it's that close and available to not connect to it. The cost to connect is maybe $400 a year. So when you build a $500,000 house land package, that scale doesn't make sense to not connect to the grid. However, we have got some cool battery technology in there that when the power goes out for the rest of the suburb, we still have Wi-Fi 
we still have um, a fridge um, and we have some level of amenity, which probably makes sense. Um, so thinking about white, white roofs, and if we focus just down on the one uh, element of your building fabric, we can be blind to the big obvious things. So planting bamboo on the western side of your house to shield your house from the afternoon sun could cost almost nothing compared to replacing a roof that might be concrete tiles, might be asbestos material, there might be a whole bunch of other complexities. So to say the easiest answer is a white roof isn't a one size fits all. And there may be some very good ways that we can, um, I love a bit of wine, so put some wine grapes on a, on a pergola on that side. You know, there's multiple ways of achieving that outcome. So simple answers, we can be blind to and overlook the, the big issue and existing, there are 10 million homes that need to be up-spec'd, up upgraded. And maybe the roof is really not the place to start for them. So solar systems are fantastic. I'm not in any way anti-solar systems. However, they have been domestic household um, available, made available by a, a huge level of government um, incentives and meddling in the process. It's not a purely commercial thing. Now, governments are also still subsidising coal-fired power stations and electricity network infrastructure, so there's no hard and fast line. But how do we or should we reduce government intervention into solar panel or should we, what they're trying to do now is to reduce the incentives, maybe they should be increasing it. We're not actually having a grown up conversation because we're looking for an easy headline answer. So in some instances, we had a conversation with a uh, electricity provider that covers an area geographically greater than the UK. So it's not a metropolitan provider. And they were saying that, because they were very interested in batteries and solar generation, because then they knew their network had 13 holes that they could not provide power for the land that was approved and being built on today. So that's a bit of a problem because their response is to go and get a transformer and upgrade the supply network to deliver power to that remote or rural region, which is hugely expensive. Like if you've ever just tried building uh, a distribution network for power, it's no easy task. So there are cases where maybe a higher level of intervention in those situations makes sense. Uh, these numbers are a little bit old, but I'll give you an example that's very tangible. In Cairns in Queensland, we pay a regulated price for electricity, which is about 28 cents, 30 cents per gigabiscuit. Um, and the production cost to deliver power to Cairns from Gladstone is about a dollar and four. So the difference is heavily subsidized and the government has a debt each year of hundreds of millions of dollars to fund that power supply because there isn't a local power supply in Cairns. And because we're on this regular, you know, electricity is a regulated thing, it has to be at this price. The star rating system for houses. So approximately 15 years ago in Australia, we said we're going to imp implement um, a thermal performance and we're going to give houses a star on how good their performance is thermally. And that was a great idea. And since the implementation of that legislation, the star rating for houses that are being built has complied. So it started off at three and a half stars, went to five stars. Some states are doing six stars and seven stars. There's even developers who are going, you know, one star higher than the state mandated uh, level to talk about their 
credentials as good performance housing. Unfortunately, because we are looking at the star rating purely from a compliance point of view, we only look at it from a cost. So we try, typically industry tries to get to the star rating, get to the compliance with a minimum cost, which doesn't necessarily mean that the house is performing what, which was the original intent for the house to perform thermally better. So in actual fact, um, although house stars have gone up in the introduction of legislation and they increase from five stars to six stars, it doesn't, it doesn't actually translate. And this is the part that a consumer misses. The consumer can't, doesn't have a hope of understanding that that doesn't translate to better performance. It should, but the, start, the system is not being used for its intent. It's used as a compliance. So as a consumer, we need examples. We need something we can go and buy today to touch and feel rather than um, being sold the, the two examples that we've offered today in the new housing market. Now, this is where we can individually take action. We can ask for high performance examples. The reason we don't is because of status quo. The controlling interests in housing do not want a different system. Their system is almost perfect because it's guaranteed to increase year on year. Um, and if you tax something at a percentage rate and it gets a higher number next year, you're going to go, go all right. So a new house and land package, that's correct. 40% is a tax take. Maybe we could think about a few other things that are very highly taxed um, that aren't, you know, that behaviour is not going to change. Every time we have an uh, annual budget, we get an increase in smoking taxes and, and alcohol excise. Uh, fuel's another very good one. My most recent fuel purchase was uh, dollars. Uh, $1.79.9, $1.80. Take off the GST, take off the excise. So the retailer gets $1.19. So it's a, that's two thirds for every litre of fuel. So it's all around us. Obviously, we're not going to reinvent the tax system, but we can be conscious and mindful of it that when we add and make bigger and more expensive houses, we're not seeing all that in bricks and mortar on the ground on our block of land. We're seeing 60% of that in bricks and mortar and labour on our block of land, and 40% is going in a tax take. So as consumers, sorry, I might have jumped ahead a slide here. As a consumer, we can de-risk change. So the construction industry is incredibly um, challenged but they do want to make change. Now, at the moment, they're probably largely talking about change. And they might have, uh, formerly we would have had mission statements, and we now got ESG statements, um, and we have advertising on TV, and we have glossy brochures when you want to go and buy a block of land. And that's necessary. But as a consumer, we can be informed and see whether they're Words are meeting their actions. Because if they're not, um, and, and we have never been more, you know, information's never been more available, we're more connected than ever, we can research what's the standard on a world stage. We don't have to look at our own personal backyard. We can say, well, how good should housing be? And I'm here to say that Australia on a world stage is uh, as a laggard as far as housing performance goes, as far as housing affordability goes, um, and, and on a number of fronts. We aren't covering ourselves in glory uh, in Australia. Another example is, is that there's several very large land developers in Australia who talk about sustainability. A recent example I was looking at where the superannuation fund is an investor in that land developer. 
and they are publicly talking about their decision to stay invested or to withdraw their funds. Now, those decisions are major decisions for a developer, for a construction company, for a utility provider, for everybody. If somebody is going to take you know, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars out of their business as an investor, that's where you get their attention. So a superannuation fund that prides itself on being um, ethical and, and uh, sustainable is working with a developer to have input to how they do development. And some of that was specifically around changing um, the order of remediation of land to keep koala habitat in place. So we can have those conversations. We can get um, change to happen. It may not be our individual purchasing power. It may be a Thrive community that pull together in a large enough audience, or it might be a super fund that says, hey, we've got X, much, X many dollars invested in this organisation. So there's multiple ways, of course. That's the beauty of this modern networked uh, world we live in with social media and the ability to pass messages around. So there's some very good uh, opportunities. I don't know if this last sentence even makes any sense, but commercial entities. So we're, we're having conversations with uh, insurance companies who want to um, meet their environmental sustainable goals. Um, they want to make the effort. And as a consumer, we can de-risk their effort by giving them permission to try. So if we say we're going to uh, buy land in that development because they've made this effort to protect koala habitat, they may not have got it perfect. They may still have other issues and challenges. But that's a, to reward that might be the better behaviour than withdrawing altogether or tossing a coin or buying another block of land that the developer makes no claim about sustainability. The information is at our fingertips and we ultimately have the ability to de-risk the change by having these conversations and encouraging uh, networks, groups, more of us to do the same. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll keep going past the star rating example, but star rating is talking specifically about housing performance and literally there are almost no examples of high performance housing, despite this being in, in legislation for 15 years. <clears throat> Today, we have uh, 10 million homes and the stats say that that's <clears throat> households consume 29% of our global energy. And that's something like 21% of the resultant CO2 emissions. I don't for one minute think that sustainability <clears throat> is just the CO2 uh, measure. And of course, CO2, carbon dioxide has been um, the anti-science or the you know, different arguments has, has become somewhat a challenging discussion for, for some people. Ultimately, that we have a measure. And I don't mind what the measure is, understanding that a measure is not perfect but we need to have some discussion and some accountability. There are some examples here that are very uh, innovative and forward thinking and the people doing them, I would encourage to um, give them some of your time, give them some of your uh, consideration when uh, embarking on the journey. Uh, we know that we can deliver a 10 star home. And we know that talking about the off-grid solar example earlier, that it used to be at a, at a substantial price premium. Um, we'd have to go and invest more money than business as usual to get an off-grid uh, system. And we have built examples of 10-star homes that are such a small difference to business as usual on a 400 and 430,000 Hassanland package um, the build cost was $7,500 more than business as usual. Now, 
because we like simple answers, the money is an easy metric to measure. Then the difficult answer is, but I've given you back six square metres of house and I've reduced your running costs of that house. A 10-star home seems to be um, that maybe 10% of the time you need to mechanically condition the spaces, whereas a five-star home, you're probably going to have to mechanically condition space half of the time. So if you just think about that from an energy and a human comfort level, um, in a five-star home or less, you're going to be running heating and cooling more than half the year. And heating and cooling has a cost. Whereas in a 10-star home, it might be one month of the year where you have to make that effort. Um, so there are some good examples there worth uh, doing some research. None of them are perfect. These are about difficult questions, not about easy answers. Um, I'm getting close to a question and answer opportunity. And in Australia, we have had a history of some really cool examples. Um, this is a, a black box. It doesn't look very black, but uh, Australia, it's an Australian invention that we um, produced a commercial flight recorder um, first in Australia. The bionic ear, it's a beautiful story to see a little child being able to hear again. Uh, Wi-Fi, we're probably all connected via Wi-Fi. Google Maps. I don't know if everyone will recognise this one from the bottom left, but it changed history, 132-year history of the America's Cup race with a bit of Australian ingenuity and a wing keel. Um, so... Change is possible. For 132 years, the race was held at the Rhode Island uh, uh, Yacht Club and then uh, some uppity Australians came along and won the race and, as a consequence, had the right to host the return race in Australia. So, yes, change is possible. Uh, and there's a multitude of other amazing changes uh, in inventions from Australia. But interestingly, not a lot in the way of housing or materials specifically. So I think I've um, perhaps rushed some of that, but uh, hopefully there's an opportunity to sit back and ask a few questions. And I would suggest uh, the takeaway for me, hopefully you got some of this yourself, is that there's small steps that we can do individually. Um, the beauty is we can also network that in a larger scale uh, through organisations and conversations like Thrive, um, your local MP, your local community organisation, go and find a sustainability builder and encourage them. Um, someone who holds himself out to be operating in this space will make mistakes and that's okay.